All right, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I have a few people that are here with us, and that's awesome, but we have an incredible presentation um, this evening from Shelba Waldron, and the topic tonight is striking a balance, navigating the fine line between demanding and demeaning coaching practices. And it's such a relevant topic, especially in the time that we're in right now, um, and finding ourselves uh, working together for the best benefit of our students. So we're really excited for this presentation and um, thanks for being here. It is being recorded so we can share this out on our Tri-State website for anyone who is going to miss it. And I'm just going to turn it over to Shelba and have her uh, introduce herself and then um, go through her presentation with us. So I hope you enjoy and thank you so much Shelba for being here this evening. I know that this is so valuable and we really appreciate your time and your effort into this presentation. So thank you. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> it's it's really an honor to be doing this, especially for anybody in the pageantry marching arts community. Um, like like uh, Shannon said, my name is Shelba Waldron. I um, I'll just give you a quick quick background, <clears throat> so you know who's talking to you. I um, I come from a long history of the activity. I've been doing uh, color guard and marching band. Winter Guard, Drum Corps, and all that type of stuff since I was 14 years old at McGavick High School in Nashville, Tennessee. Then I went on to do Drum Corps, Winter Guard um, with Pride and with the Star of Indiana. And then I've been teaching and judging um, ever since. In my professional career, I work at USA Gymnastics. Um, I am five years, literally this week, I started as their director of safe sport um, education and policy. So all those safe sport policies that the whole gymnastics community has to follow. I was one of the architects of it. Um, and uh, now I'm the director of outreach, and, uh, outreach for our coaching community. So I get to basically sit on the phone and talk to coaches about problems that they're having in the gym. One of the things that um, every summer we do what's called um, our, we have what's called our Congress season where we have regional and that, uh, regional Congresses all over the country, three day, it's basically three days of workshops for coaches and club owners. And then it concludes at the national Congress that coincides with our nationals. And I presented this workshop um, in multiple different types of forms throughout the summer, <clears throat> because we had a request from our coaching community that they were having issues with parents not understanding what tough coaching was, not really understanding that just because you raised your voice does not necessarily mean it's emotional abuse. And we had put out, uh, we made our coaches in the gymnastics community take a course on emotional abuse. That was very specific to the gymnastics community. And everybody seems to understand emotional abuse. What's a little bit grayer line is um, the demeaning, demanding side of it. So throughout the summer, I presented this workshop and it got changed each Congress that I went to because of the dialogue, the very rich dialogue that we would have <clears throat> um, throughout the summer. So what I'm gonna present to you today, it, I swear it's not gonna be death by PowerPoint, but I can't do it without PowerPoint because there's so much information to give you. Um, but I'm gonna take you through that presentation that um, our gymnastics community received. And I will tell you, um, as the summer went on, we the the room was standing room only because this topic is so important and it's so crucial. And basically, the coaches are saying, "I don't want to be safe sported," is what they're saying. And so part of that is part of this is me helping them understand what it really means to be an emotionally abusive coach and what it means to be a demanding coach and that you have the right to demand excellence. So I'm going to take you through this today. So as you go through this, I want you to think about why we're going to start with parents and we're going to talk about parents. And I want you to think about why parents sign their kids up for sports or other activities. Um, most people, when I ask this question in a live setting, would say things like, I, you know, they want their kids to be physically active. They want their kids to learn discipline. They want their kids to make friends. <clears throat> and that's all completely accurate. I'm going to tell you why I did it. So my, this is my son, Joshua. He has been in activities since he was four. <clears throat> Started with Little League Baseball, went into karate. Then he did gymnastics, then tennis. He's still in tennis, by the way. And now he's in <clears throat> a BOA level marching band 
in color guard. He's in Fisher's high school. Go Fisher's. Yay. Okay. So I picked when I was doing this workshop, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had a cold, so I'm struggling talking at times. Um, I picked some, some of these pictures that when these pictures helped me as a parent and me specifically as a garden instructor, um, learn lessons by watching my son interact with his coaches. And I'm not gonna go through each one because <clears throat> we don't have time for it, but I wanna point out the picture at the top of the kids eating pizza. This was when he was in Little League Baseball and his team had just <clears throat> played in their uh, playoff game, their local playoff game. And they won, yay. Okay, <clears throat> to be honest with you, Little League Baseball winning a playoff game, it just means you're gonna sit in the hot sun for another weekend. So we were like, oh my God, we won. Okay, so <clears throat> after the game, the kids, the coaches ordered pizza for the boys. The boys went and sat down, ate their pizza. The parents ordered sodas and ice cream. We did the whole shebang. <clears throat> and the whole time we listened as parents on the periphery, listened at these boys giggled as they laughed, as they laughed with their coaches, as they told farting jokes because they were eight-year-old boys, seven-year-old boys. And that's what they, that's the jokes they tell. They told mama jokes and they just laughed. <clears throat> they didn't care about that game. They didn't ever once talk about the game. They, that what they loved was the pizza. And when I asked my son that night, I was like, what's your favorite part? I always ask him, what's your favorite part? How did practice go today? And he says, he goes, the pizza was so good. He never once mentioned the game. And as a parent, I really took a step back and I was like, it's just simply not. That's just not what's important to them is that whole game thing. That's just a means to get to the pizza. As a garden instructor, I learned that it's okay to have fun. And each one of these pictures brings me to a different story, which I could just tell all day long. But what I want to tell you is this story. This is a picture of my son in gymnastics. And he was level when he was level five or six. And this was state meet. Josh was never going to be an Olympian. He was never going to get the college scholarship, but he was a halfway decent gymnast. And um, at state meet that year, there are six events. And in each event, his score beat every other score that he had had that season. So he did exactly what you're supposed to do at the last meet of the season. He, he, he peaked. I was very excited. I was very proud of him. We get to the award ceremony and the award ceremony is kind of chaotic in the gymnastics world. And they have, they have different levels they call out. They have different age groups and you can never really tell where your kid is, but they, they just, kid after kid after kid was going up to get medals, to get trophies, to get awards. And he was never called because even though it was his best score, it wasn't the best score of the day. And in gymnastics, depending on the meet you get, they give out eight to 10 medals. So I was thinking as a parent, I'm thinking, how do I have this conversation? Because even adults don't quite grasp the concept sometimes of I've worked so hard. Why didn't I get the reward? How do I tell a nine-year-old this? How do I, what, what do I talk about? Like you work so hard, good for you, you know? And so I was sitting there worried about it. And then all of a sudden they called his name and third place on, I believe it was vault. And he looks down, he grabs the medal, he looked back up and he says, mom, look. And that's when I snapped the picture. And of course, mom's, I'm crying. And then he goes to the coach. He says, look what we did. And then the coach says, buddy, look what you did. And it occurred to me that day, the reason why I signed my kid up for activities is to be successful or to feel successful. And that does not mean getting medals in it or trophies. It means that when I pay my money and commit my family's time to a sport or an activity, my expectation on the coach is that they're going to help my child feel successful, no matter what he's going to do. Even if he's going to be last place, I want him to walk away from that meet, from that band contest, from whatever it is he's doing, feeling that he was successful. And as a garden instructor, it has completely changed how I manage my color guard rehearsals because I used to be, in my 20s and in my 30s, just drive, just do it again, do it again, do it again. And that's important. You have to do it again. If you want 
to have, if you have any competitive goals of going to Dayton, if you have any competitive goals of meddling at your circuit championships, you have to do it again. Even if your competitive goal is just to make it through the season, let's pray we have the same group of kids we started with, right? You still have to do it again. But how you go about it, it has everything to do with making these kids feel successful. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's how you're going to, we're going to start this conversation about what is demeaning and what is demanding and what are you allowed to do? Um, One of the things we did this summer with our coaches is we asked them to create a coaching philosophy. A coaching philosophy is basically your beliefs, what you hold true to yourself. It's your coaching behaviors and your practices based off of your values. So to do that, you have to identify your core beliefs. I've just put down a few of mine. I believe rehearsal must start on time. That's a big one with me. I also believe each performer starts the process at different levels and deserves to be taught as such. I know that we're going to have someone who can come in and just start throwing things in the air and catching it. We have kids who will barely be able to pick up the equipment without dropping it. And it's up to me to make each kid feel successful. Um, I believe performers must be treated with respect. I believe parents are an integral part of the process. And I believe the staff must be educated. Those are my core beliefs as a uh, color guard educator, as an instructor. How I bring those out in rehearsal has everything to do with my values. Then the next thing we asked our coaches to do is determine the standards for performance, both for yourself, your staff, your performers, and your parents. So asking them, what are the expectations you have for yourself based off of your values? Well, with my values, I need to show up earlier than the performers do, because I want to make sure that I'm on time. I need to make sure that I am educated. I need to make sure that I respect, that I am showing respect to the performers as they walk through the door. Hey, how are you doing? You know, how was your day at school? You know, how's everybody going to, like, how are we, how, how is everything going today? As opposed to, did everyone practice? There's a difference in the concept to me and how respect is, is, is given and earned. Um, how do you bring those core beliefs to life? And when you talk to the kids, when you talk to the parents, when you talk to your administration, and then the last one is simply, we ask them to identify their purpose. Why do they coach? What is it in, what is in it for them? We can all say it's about the kids, but I look back in my twenties and and I'm in my fifties now, so I can say I've got 30 years on, on in this. And I'm not sure I was in it for the kids because I can remember very clearly that I wanted to go to Dayton, that I wanted to have guards and finals, that I wanted to teach world-class, that I wanted to teach world-class kids. And when I look back, I think about I, 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 me, me, me. You know, over time, I started to develop into we. And then I started to turn it into you. And so that is now why I coach is very different from when I used to coach. I still want to go to Dayton. I still love like this weekend, my band made it to state finals and we walked on the field at um, Lucas Oil. Really freaking cool. (laughs) You know, I still love to challenge a color guard. But the reason I walk on that field now is very, very different. At the end, we asked them to create an elevator speech. If you were to talk to a group of parents who who came in for their first meeting, their first understanding of, of color guard, they're signing their kid up, what would you say to them? How would you parlay your philosophy to them so they can understand what it is that you're all about. Same thing with the kids and your administration. How do you get everybody on the same page through your elevator speech? And I say all this because I just kind of, I really believe that this was a really great exercise that we spent like 45 minutes doing it, which we're not going to do today, but I encourage you to go through that process yourself. I have gone through this process. And I've written down my elevator speech, even as someone in their 50s, I have learned by doing this particular exercise. And by doing the exercise, as we get into the demeaning and demanding stuff, you're going to start to realize <clears throat> that type of behavior or that type of comment does not fit my value system. How do I change that value system? To start, we have to talk about the, af- the athlete triangle. It starts with the athlete in the center. Then you add the parent. Then you add the coach, then you add your administration. And the three on the outside are what supports the performer. And each one 
in this triangle, including the athlete or the performer, has a particular um, role. They have a role to play and they have expectations within that role. So setting the stage. If you want to not, if you want parents and the kids to understand who you are as a person, how you're going to coach, what your philosophy is, you have to set and manage the expectations. That and we're going to talk about that, but that includes not just about how much money you have to pay and when do you have to be at rehearsal and we expect you to practice at home. Those are really easy and basic expectations, but expectations on things like respect, showing up on time. And what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, um, I'm going back to mine, uh, treating each, well, I've already said respect, but uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, <laughs> but, um, but how do you, how do you set the stage? How do you set those expectations? communicating those expectations effectively and setting um, setting your boundaries. And that one's going to be really crucial. What we're going to, what, what you're going to find that we're going to talk about when we talk about demeaning coaching practices a little bit later is that those, those environments that, that have those color guard environments or sporting environments that have demeaning coaching practices usually have a very mixed boundary setting. Whereas the coach is having interactions with the kids that they should not be having. And I'm not talking physical interactions. We're talking verbal interactions. Same thing with the parents and same thing with administration and making the right decisions about personnel, training and design. So here are the expectations of a coach. Determine the competitive objective for the team. Number one, assist each performer in setting attainable goals and guiding the performer towards their goals. So you, you have to set team goals, but you also have to set individual goals. And it's hard. You got a guard of 25 and 30, you know, what, and, but each kid comes into it to feel successful. So what does that mean to them? So they're brand new. They can barely hold a flag. They're learning drop spins. Is that success for them? Having the conversation about, I want to know what success means to you. I spent most of my time this, this fall with the flag line at the color guard I taught and I asked each one of them, I'm like, what does success look like to you? And some of them had a hard time. They're like, I want to make state finals. I'm like, no, that's a team goal. What is your goal? Well, I want to make the winter guard, the varsity guard. Okay, let's talk about how we can get you there. That's a goal. And then we work towards it. De um, wow, that skipped. Design a training program that is appropriate and conducive to each level of the performer. Conduct practices based on proven training principles and geared to the specific goals of the team. Um, evaluate and analyze practice and competitive performance, provide necessary instruction and feedback to enhance performance, create a caring and, and inclusive environment, and then communicate regularly with parents. This might seem pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised in all the safe sport reports that I have read, which is now in the thousands, how many coaches have left out many parts of this. And then they wonder why they're getting safe sported or they wonder why parents are complaining or that they are getting fired and they're moving from gym to gym to gym. The parent expectations. You can't start this without creating parent expectations and talking to parents about what they, what you expect them to do. And it's beyond just raising money. Par provide a consistent, loving and supporting and supportive environment. We know that there are kids that do not have this. And anytime you can actually talk to parents about what it means to be a supportive sports parent is a really good thing. You're going to have kids, especially in our activity, who've never done sports and their parents don't know how to be a sports parent. So you have to talk to them about that. What does it mean to be a supportive and loving sport parent? Show interest by supporting their performer's commitment to practices, attending competitions, and engaging in other key parental roles, fundraising, volunteering, um, helping, encouraging their child to practice at home, communicating early about scheduling conflicts, financial concerns, concerns over health and mental health. This one is often left out. <coughs> Communi commit to supporting the coach and program while in front of their child. Um, we always tell, um, I always encourage club owners to, when they talk to parents at the beginning of every season to really, to send this phrase out, come and talk to us. If you have any concerns, come and talk to us. Because if you have a closed environment where the parents are afraid to talk to you, they're going to talk to their kid and they're going to talk to other parents. And it's going to come across as negative. No one's going to sit around and talk to other parents about how fantastic you are 
if you have created an environment that is fearful, where if parents come and talk to you that everything starts with a defense um, and to ensure their child is safe. This is their job. Their job is my job, my son at Fisher's. I've never had an issue at Fisher's, by the way, but if I did, my job is to go to the band director or the guard director and say, hey, my job is to keep him safe. And this is how I feel. He is not being kept safe at this point in time. It is their job. And the only way they can do their job is that they understand their expectations and they understand the philosophy of the program. Because if you don't tell them your expectations, they're going to create their own. The athlete or performer learn to advocate for themselves, work with the coach to set attainable goals, communicate with the coach and parents about their needs, goals, medical concerns, any other concern that might come up, maintain a healthy lifestyle consistent with a competitive athlete, um, maintain control over schedule responsibilities, be honest and upfront when thoughts of leaving are entertained and have fun and become as good as they are able to strive. And the only way that they can achieve this is by having an environment where they trust the coach. They can't learn to advocate for themselves if they're afraid to walk up to the coach. And as we get further into this, you're going to find that these demeaning, these demeaning environments do not allow for advocacy. Um, when you set expectations with parents and athletes, you have to set at, um, practice time and length. What and how? What are we going to do? How are we going to go about it? There's not one parent that gets up in the morning unless they've already been in the activity and goes, oh, my gosh, my kid is in color guard. I love it. I can't wait. And they understand everything that goes with it. If they were to, if the child was to come up and say, hey, mom, I joined the soccer team at school. We all kind of go, oh, I get soccer. I understand it's running around, kicking a ball. You're going to probably do a lot of running and, you know, probably some endurance type of stuff. Right. Yeah. Color guard's a little bit different. So we have to walk them through an understanding of it, how we're going to go about it competitive, when, how many, how does it work? What's the system? Um, what are our goals? Who are we competing with? What does it all mean? Um, and then the financial, how much, when's the money due? What happens when they fail to pay? And so this is all about setting your expectations. Once the table is set, you can then start teaching. Because all of a sudden, everybody is on a, a very clean slate at that point. And that's what you're going for is starting with the clean slate. Then there's communication. You need to communicate with consistency, with empathy, and when it's necessary. I can tell you when I was in my 20s and even up until probably my early 30s, I didn't want to talk to parents. I did not want to bring kids in and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Everything about that scared me. I wanted to just teach. And I wanted to give big announcements and I wanted to give big speeches. And I look back and I just, I'm just mortified sometimes with the big speeches and the not bringing the kids in and not bringing the parents in and having the one-on-one -on -one conversations, having, having the, the meetings with the parents more than just at the beginning, you know, a meeting in the middle of the season, a meeting at the end of the season, you know, how did it go? Let's take some surveys. Let's find out what you're thinking. You know, how can we improve? How can we get better? Even when everybody seems happy, you have a guard of 30, 20 or so, and you you need to engage them. Um, it's just like if you the parents are buying a product from you and the product is I want my child to feel successful. And if you don't engage them and you don't talk to them about what that looks like, and how that season went, you'll never know how to grow and never know what the parents are saying behind the scenes. Um, I'll tell you as a parent, we talk, we love to sit around and go, hey, let you know, and we do fundraisers together and then we chit chat. It's not always bad. It's usually with my program, the kids, the programs my kids have been in, it's always been good, but parents talk and they talk more when they don't have a garden structure or a band director that lends itself to open dialogue. Um, by the way, I can't see anybody, so it's really weird. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to a void. So uh, I hope you uh, don't think I'm just like lecturing, lecturing, but okay, anyway, here we go. All right, communication measures. Communicate coaching and program philosophy at the beginning of every new season, every new season. Um, set appropriate boundaries for performer and parent communication. That's, that's the when can you contact me? How can you contact me? Where are we going to have these conversations? 
Um, ensure communication about money, practice, travel, changes in schedule is communicated clearly and early. Um, be available to address parental concerns swiftly and professionally, never through text, um, never through email. You know, I'll be happy to meet with you tomorrow night after practice or tomorrow night before practice, or can I give you a call? You know, making sure those times are set that it's not on your personal time at 10 o'clock at night. Nothing good ever comes out of 10 o'clock at night when it comes to parent conversations. Um, manage the outlier quickly. Um, one of the things that we see in the gymnastics community is you have a parent or a child. I, I keep on talking about parents, but also the kids. And there's an outlier, meaning they're the ones that are complaining. They're not doing anything. You might think that they're lazy or they're trying to get around something. That's an outlier. Most of the kids that we work with, that we coach, that we instruct, want to be there. They want to work hard. Oftentimes, the outlier is not an attitude problem. It's oftentimes an issue with goal alignment or alignment between the parent, the kid, and the coach. And because it, everything's not aligned, you have outliers. And those outliers make you think that all the parents are talking about you or all the kids are acting out and that you want to quit, that you want to do this. So manage the outlier as quickly as possible. And sometimes managing the outlier means cutting somebody loose. And I tell coaches this when I talk to them all the time. I say, I know you don't want to, but it might be time to cut that athlete loose, cut that family apart because uh, away from your club, because if you don't, it's going to impact your coaching ability. And then they are going to perceive everything you do as negative. And it's not, and you should never cut kids or cut them loose quickly, um, haphazardly. There should always be other people involved. There should always be documentation. But sometimes you have to do that because if you don't, that what 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 starts as demanding turns into demeaning by their perception only. And encourage parents to be proactive in planning ahead and communicating conflicts and problems. The only way they can do this is if they have an environment where they feel comfortable. Um, remain professional and calm when talking with parents and avoid any gossip or breach of confidentiality. Talking about other parents in front of parents is a no-no. <clears throat> um, and talking about kids in front of other parents that is not their child is also. And I say that, and I, I believe everybody probably on this call would think, well, duh. But I've dealt with my share of coaches. And in this activity, I've known guard instructors who have that friend who's a parent, and they're telling them all the gossip of all the kids, of all the other parents, and it just creates a hostile environment. Support the new parents, don't leave them hanging. Some of the best guard programs in the country have mentorship programs for the parents <clears throat> and the kids who are just new coming in. Create post-competition communications when possible. Parents are often confused about scores, about placements, because it's not an easy system to understand. There are five judges. Each judge, you know, has their 20 points or, you know, whatever, and you get 100 points at the end. And, wow, we got a 56 and that guard got a 76. I don't understand what's happening. Have the conversations with the parents so they understand how far you have to go and if it's even possible to reach that particular point. They might not understand we will never get to an 80 because it's not realistic because we just started out, we've got brand new kids. We're, our goal was to get to a 75. That was our ultimate goal. And that's mid box four and all that type of stuff. And help them understand that. Help the kids understand that. Um, and then setting your boundaries. Set clear expectations from the beginning. Create office hours that you don't break. Um, know where your social media boundaries lie. Um, bite your tongue. Prioritize face-to-face -face meetings. And be consistent with all families. Setting boundaries demonstrates your professionalism. The more boundaries that you have set, the more they're going to see you as a professional coach and they're going to treat you as such. So now kind of that I've done all that, what I want to do is because the, the whole thing was about setting the stage, right? I want to talk about demeaning and demanding practices. There, there is a fine line between them. Um, it's all about perception and interpretation. And setting the stage beforehand will help with the perception and the interpretations. You have to consider age. You have to consider developmental level when you speak to them. Experience in sports in general. I'm talking about the kids, obviously. The, their parents' experience in sports. 
misaligning the physicality and the mental toughness? Do the kids have what they might have the physical ability to do what you're asking? Do they have the mental ability to manage it? And the one thing that I always tell parents, I always say, it's going to be easy and it's going to get harder and harder and harder when we get to March. It's going to be extremely difficult and I'm going to help you understand what March is going to look like. So we're going to do it again and we're going to do it again and we're going to do it again. And we're going to do another run through and then another thing because we have to build their stamina. So have, it, helping them understand the mental toughness, ability to manage the number of and length of practices, <coughs> their mental health, the mental health of the performers. Um, there's another workshop that I used to do that I did this summer on mental health. And this is a big one in the gymnastics community in the Olympic movement. We're really working with the coaches on mental health. And I can tell you that um, the mental health of the uh, mental health of teenagers has declined in the past five years. We have evidence from it from the CDC and we have evidence of research being done by the USOPC and they are speaking out more. They are they are speaking out more about depression and about anxiety. And we're starting to see that. And when you have kids who are suffering from depression and anxiety, the way they perceive you speak to them could come across as derogatory or demeaning as opposed to what you would consider demanding. So you have to take all of this into account. And it's a lot. It's a lot when you talk to them and you're like, wow, I have to think about their mental health and I have to think about their age and the developmental level. Well, yeah, you do. And that's the nature of the world we're living in right now. So um, all of this matters. And I can say this really clearly um, and honestly, that by dealing with so many parents I've dealt with at USA Gymnastics and so many athletes or so sorry, so many coaches, the perception and interpretation is everything. The way you speak to a 13 year old is different than the way you can speak to an 18 year old. These color guards that have high schoolers and middle schoolers combined in the same program, it's an uphill battle dealing with the, the developmental levels, dealing with what they can mentally handle. Their bodies might be able to throw a six, but it doesn't mean their minds can handle what's coming with that. Um, that's a, if you ever want to have a private conversation, we can talk all day long about mixing middle schoolers and high schoolers, but um, you got to consider all of this. Other factors consider differences in approach between staff members. You've got the nice staff member and you've got the tough staff member. And when one staff member is standing in front of a group of kids and then the other one comes in, how do those kids perceive it? How do the parents perceive it? Sarcasm, don't use sarcasm. It's going to just get you into trouble. Inside jokes, don't do it. And comments unrelated to guard, don't do it. <clears throat> um, stay focused on color guard, on school, on anything that has to do with your job as a color guard instructor. Um, the look of favoritism, the look of targeting, like you're targeting, you're going after that kid. <clears throat> creating unnecessary competition between performers. It's okay. Like we tell them like, Hey, you know, find someone in the gym that you want to like, I do this drop spin exercise where I'm like, find someone in the gym and look across from it. And you guys just kind of go at it. Right. <clears throat> That's not what I'm talking about. Unnecessary competition when it comes to who's going to make varsity, who's not, you know, and keeping everybody guessing, making sure that you have processes for everything. This is how you make the varsity guard. This is how you make the, uh, this is how you make the rifle line. This is how you become a soloist. So because otherwise there, there becomes this, this competition that happens between the performers and then what then they perceive then favorites. So then they say, well, he is favoring her. And so I'm always getting yelled at. And that might not be the case, but if you've created this environment, that's how they're going to perceive it. Making statements or situations where the performers or parents are left questioning the future role of the performer. I'm going to kick you out if you do this again. If you're not ready to live up to it, don't say it. Um, or the future of the program. I just want to leave. I just want to quit and by the end of next year. Everybody's guessing. I have heard guard instructors say that to kids. And I'm like, I cannot believe you actively came out and said that you're going to, that you want to quit. What is that? What does that message send? Um, and now everything you say after this leaves them questioning. Um, inconsistent disciplinary measures between performers night to night and between staff. What I want to do on this one, I want to give everybody, I want to, I want to give you this phrase 
And I want you to kind of keep it in your mind before I get to the next. We really talk about deme demeaning practices. Everybody get out of the gym. I've said that. I know I've said that. I haven't said it in probably a decade, but <clears throat> everybody get out of the gym. Now, in this scenario, I'm going to give you the color guard is dropping a lot. You're doing a run of something and they're then they just can't do it. You're not mad at them. You're mad at yourself because the phrase should not have been written that way. They can't do it. They don't have the skills. So you kick them out because you need time to think. You're like, I need, I need, I'm frustrated right now. I need time to think. I need to figure out how to rewrite this phrase. And I can't have everybody just staring at me. Okay. That's a very legitimate thing to do. How did you say it? How was it perceived? How did you go about it? So just kind of keep this in your head because we're going to get to this in a second. Same one with this one. Everyone who dropped do 25 push-ups. <clears throat> That's not an unreasonable task. I don't do this anymore. In fact, I don't, I don't, I never really did this, to be honest with you. But there are times when you can do this. Okay. We're going to talk about how they perceived it in a second. So there is demanding, there is derogatory, there is demeaning, and there's emotional abuse. And how you manage both of those situations can turn to be any one of them based off the perception of the performer. So demanding, it's a practice requiring much time, effort, and attention. You have the right as a guard instructor to be demanding, to demand excellence of your performers, no matter if you're regional A or you're independent world class. So here's the, here's the <clears throat> quote, you're doing great. Not quite there yet because we have too many people who aren't grasping the speed changes causing drops. So let's do it again to make it stick. Before that, I would like it if everybody would leave the gym to get some fresh air and clear their heads. That's an acceptable thing to do. You've given them a very clear direction and everybody understands why. We are dropping more than I would like and much of that has to do with upper body strength. Let's do 25 push-ups together to help build our upper body strength. Let's do it together. And let's do it because we're going to build upper body strength. Okay. It's positive. It's uplifting. Demanding coaching shapes the performer's self-esteem and confidence as part of the coaching process while remaining consistent and demanding excellence. Excellence is derived from internal desire to achieve overall goals for self, team, and coach. Derogatory. Derogatory comments are when a person expresses a low opinion or showing strong disapproval. And we have all done it. You can't, I don't think you can teach 30 years and not at times be derogatory. Derogatory is a one-off situation. It's when, a, uh, so on this one, that run through was terrible. You keep missing the speed changes. Just set it up again. Just wait, get out of the gym until you've cleared your head. Much different approach. The rifle line is the reason we scored poorly. Don't ever say that, by the way. <laughs> um, I want to see 25 push-ups from every rifle who dropped. It's that now you're starting to build this derogatory demeaning environment. I want to see 25 push-ups from every rifle who dropped. You know what doing push-ups for dropping does? It makes people cheat. And because they're going to, because now you have fear. They're afraid to disappoint the coach. They're afraid of being called out. So they're going to cheat to get to, to survive. And the kids that did it, did it full out and they just happened to drop are now being punished for what in color guard, just like gymnastics, you should be allowed to drop. In gymnastics, you should be allowed to fall off the beam without being yelled at because that's how you get better. Derogatory comments can stand alone and be a one-time slip in the heat of the moment or if strung together, starts to become demeaning coaching practices. Demeaning are comments that damage or lower the character, status, or reputation of the other person. I hope you aren't proud of yourself. You shouldn't be. That run through was terrible. Do it again for Susan, who can't seem to understand the speed changes. I should have never put you on the rifle line. You clearly don't care. Do 25 push-ups by yourself. We'll wait. Um, I, I This is said. This is said frequently in gyms on drum corps fields, in marching man fields across the country. Um, anytime you embarrass somebody, anytime you single them out in such a way, anytime that you tell them that you made a mistake because they are the ones that are the mistake is you're now becoming demeaning. You've created a system of fear and you've created a system where this, where the students start to not believe in themselves and they're not going to believe in you. 
Um, demeaning comments are intended to tear a person down to the point where they question themselves um, while creating an atmosphere where those involved feel as if they're walking on eggshells. Um, excellence is the system is derived from fear of failure. When, and when it is sustained, it's considered emotional abuse. I can tell you that I have marched under demeaning instructors. And I've marched with some great, under some great ones, and I've marched in, under some demeaning ones. And it's a very different feeling when you come off the floor. Emotional abuse is simply a repetitive, non-contact, possibly contact, please don't ever contact the kids, um, based experience meant to induce fear by exposing targets to ongoing attacks and belittling them, humiliating them, and it includes an imbalance of power. This is the uh, national definition under the Center for Safe Sport. Emotional abuse, uh, abuse of coaching practices are based in the sustained use of power to control the performer through fear. These environments are all about fear. And it is taking those derogatory, demeaning comments, stringing them together every single night, every single day. When you are dealing with a situation, consider your role in the problem. If you want to really work on yourself as a coach, consider what you have contributed to a particular problem. So in this scenario, Emily frequently drops her rifle and hasn't gone without dropping at least once in every show. Consider the following before you react. Her past performance issues. Has, was Emily really, does, does she have uh, mental breaks? Did she have mental breaks during marching band season, even on flag? Um, practice versus performance variations. Is there something that's happening that's blocking her mentally? Um, maturity and experience, you know, um, and then ability during rehearsals to build muscle memory. So this has everything to do with the coach. The choices that the coach made to put Emily on the rifle line, the coach, the, the way the coach is training. Now, if it is, let's say, a mental block, when in, in gymnastics, we deal with mental blocks all the time. So what do you do to get Emily through the mental block? Um, what are you doing from a psychological standpoint? Are you encouraging her to maybe see a sports psychologist, you know, or maybe talking to mom and dad about it, things like that. Our coaches in the gymnastics world talk to parents all the time. And they, and we have normalized in the sports world, kids going to see sports psychologists to deal with mental blocks. In the color guard world, we never talk about this stuff ever. Um, should she have been put on the rifle line to begin with? You have to ask yourself these questions. Did you look to change her role once it was realized that she was inconsistent? Do you train sufficiently enough to build consistency or you just rely practicing at home? Did you start the season off doing a lot of basics and now you don't do any? Um, did you start the season off where she had these skills and over the time she lost those skills because all you did was work on parts of the show? And all of this matters. So before you react, before you give a response to another drop by Emily, consider everything that's involved and then craft your response. The key differences between demanding and demeaning environments, it starts with respect and safety, showing performers individual and cultural respect, allowing autonomy and decisions and encouraging goal, um, goal discussions. So I respect you enough as a performer that we're gonna talk about who you are, about what you want out of this program, about how things are going. You can come up to me and talk to me about this stuff and it's okay. So you wanna know why I made the decisions I made tonight at practice? Come up and talk to me about it. You know, I have no problem with kids coming to me on the field saying, hey, could you re-explain what you just said? Because it didn't come across right. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Let's go talk about this. That's respect. Safe environment. The team space is welcoming, allowing performers to feel collab uh, comfortable making mistakes while giving their best effort at practice. They should be allowed to make mistakes. They have to make mistakes. It's the only way they get better. It's the only way that we teach them that when you get done with this, that when you go into life, like college and the workforce, you're going to make mistakes. How do you recover from it? And how can I help you understand that it's okay? Um, it, it is okay to set high standards and you should set high standards at the very beginning. That is expecting hard work and excellence. Universal high standards for everyone in the organization, the parents, the kids, the staff, 
the administration, um, offering respectful yet critical feedback willingly. Um, and then the demeaning is everything else. It's insulting, it's disparaging, it makes people feel small, it's disregarding others' value and voice, it's intimidating and threatening interactions. Um, characteristics, we only have like three more slides, so just bear with me. Characteristics of demand um, for the purpose of excellence. It's demand for the purpose of excellence. And that's how you talk to the parents. We are going to, we're going to build the demand as the season goes on because we're trying to reach for excellence. Um, process oriented. Um, in these environments, emphasis on the training process and not just the outcome. <coughs> Embracing failure as learning. Errors and failures are part of the learning process and are accepted. Um, I can tell you that I've had shows where kids just dropped and they dropped and they dropped and they dropped. And as I get older, I start to look more at myself. I'm like, what, what could I have done? Was it warm up? Was it rehearsal? Did we rehearse too much? Did we rehearse not enough? Did I, did I do the right training? Did I not do the right training? Do I have the right personnel in the right spots? You know, and I start to look more at myself. Um, I used to think it was more of like, you don't care. You don't care. That's not the case. These kids care or they wouldn't be there. I always tell coaches when I work with them that the kids care. They want to do their best. And sometimes they just can't do it. They don't have the right tools to make it happen. Encouraging performance focused critique is the feedback you're giving encouraging and aimed at improving performance, not outcomes. Um, are you collaborative? Are you setting your goals with the performers and not for them? Um, are you conditioning for training, not punishment? Conditioning is used for a training tool, not as a punitive measure. It is, you, you cannot do punishment through exercise. It is becoming a dated practice. Um, it is a practice that is getting coaches in trouble um, in the Olympic movement. There are other ways to discipline kids. But when you use it through exercise, if you do push-ups or running for the sake of it because you're angry, then they start associating um, running and push-ups and sit-ups and whatever. Do go, go back to the corner and do rifle tosses until I tell you to stop. That is no longer constructive. It's punitive. Um, discipline is consistent, is consistent and used sparingly, not excessively. Um, if you do it right, you should never have to discipline the kids ever unless you have the outlier and then that is sparingly. Um, performers willingly attend practice and aim to achieve personal goals, safe environment for expression. Performers feel respected, loved and safe to voice their thoughts, involvement and respect for parents. Parents are respected as valued contributors of the process. That doesn't mean they're allowed to come in and tell you how to coach. It does mean that they, that, that you have an open door policy and you're not afraid to have a conversation with them. Um, and you are the inspirational guide. You inspire self-realization and personal growth. Those kids want to do more color guard because of you. They want to go do drum corps. They want to go march independent programs. They want to figure out how to be in the varsity guard and not just, you know, stop at the marching band because you are inspiring them to be the best version of themselves. This is what a demanding for the purpose of excellent environment looks like. The demeaning environments is everything else. The focus is on the, on the outcome, the zero sum game. Because it's because of the rifle line. I actually heard this come out of somebody's mouth fairly recently. The rifle line is the reason we didn't score well. That is never the case. As a judge, I can tell you that is never the case. You look at the entire production and you look at everything in its totality. And that is just a demeaning action a demeaning statement to make, to make people feel bad. Um, mistakes or errors are met with shame, not constructive feedback. Fear-based performance is used to motivate as opposed to be, it being encouraging and supportive. Insulting, critiques are insulting. Feedback is often insulting, demoralizing rather than construction, constructive. Using exercise as punishment, the kids are starting to show signs of burnout well before the season is over. Um, fear of speaking up. They're afraid of you. You never know what's going on in their world. I always tell people, say hello to every one of them, if you can. I always try to say, hey, how are you doing? You know, how was school today? I, I try to hit each kid on the field at least once. It's not always easy when you have 30, 35 kids. But if I can get to half, I feel good about myself that day. Um, 
And um, I want to know how things are. How was school? Oh, that math, that math test sucked. And I'm like, okay, you're going to go home and study tonight, right? Yep. Okay, let's go. Let's do some drop spins, right? Um, lack of parent involvement. The parents are not a part of your process because you haven't opened the door to them. They're afraid. They're afraid to speak up. They're afraid to come to practice. They stay in their cars. Um, they, and then they talk. They talk. They text each other. They have texting chats. They, they uh, talk in the parking lot. They talk at the shows, but they're not talking to you. If you're not having conversations with the parents on a regular basis, if you're not at least acknowledging them that they're there, hey, Miss Smith, how are you doing? Great. How did Susie do on her math test? Oh, not so great. Got to do that studying. You know, it's all you need. Um, violation of boundaries. Boundaries are frequently in these environments crossed. <clears throat> um, it impacts the personal and psychological space of the performer. Um, it's going up to them. It's closing down the space, physicality, the physicality. Um, and it is, um, it is texting athlete or performers. It is uh, texting parents. It is going beyond what should be allowed. Um, it is touching their stuff. You know, I, I make it a point to try to never touch their stuff. And it's even their equipment. Um, and then if I do, I'm like, can I spin your saber? Because sometimes I want to have something in my hands just so they know that I'm not just hovering around their stuff. I'm not violating their personal space. And you never, and in these environments, they never meet expectations of the coach. The show is never good enough. The uh, score is never good enough. The guard is never good enough. Nothing is ever good enough. And it's always someone else's fault. I want to close with this. The Olympic movement is really working on getting their, what they call their high performance coaches. And this is across all 50 plus sports that, that you see in the Olympics. And the high performance coaches are ones that, that train elite athletes. If you train color guard, if you train um, performers at the drum corps level or at the independent world level, you're in a high performance environment. So I'm kind of talking about you. Um, but they are working with their high performance coaches on mentoring and giving feedback when they go to the Olympic Training Center and not feedback on how, on what you're saying to the athlete, like not on, hey, you could have told them how to do that backflip somersault upside down thing differently. Not that. It's not about talking about your show design. They are giving feedback on how they coach, how much, what they say to the kids, the tone of voice, their body language, how the kids interpret it. They're bringing in psychologists to evaluate. And then they pull the coach aside and they give a session with them. And we're doing this because the mental health of the athletes have become so crucial and kids are different today. They're not any more sensitive than we were. They are just more attuned to their emotions and what their rights are. They have rights and they have the right to not be talked to and treated in a certain way. And we didn't know we had those rights. When I was in drum corps, I didn't know I had those type of rights. I would do drum corps again in a minute, but I wish I had had more of a, an environment where it was an open door, where I had agency, personal agency and voice. So be willing to open yourself up to feedback on how you coach, not just on the show. Be willing to look at the decisions you made before and throughout the season before you place blame on the performers, parents or other staff members. Seek out performer and parent feedback. Um, be sparse and deliberate when you close rehearsals. Don't close rehearsals. You should always have somebody there, a parent. Somebody, somebody needs to be there to make sure that there's never any type of misinformation that's being construed to parents when the kid goes home. And don't let the outlier be the reason for your perception of the kid's parents or problems. Um, finally, open yourself up. Embrace the mentorship. Lead by example. Have a continuous learning attitude and be receptive to the feedback. I can't stress that enough. Um, I'll be happy if you want to take down my num my email to send you this presentation um, and have further conversations. This is what I do. I'm the outreach director for USA Gymnastics and I talk to coaches all the time and they bring me their problems about um, what's happening. They're like, this parent thought I said this, their child went home and they thought uh, I said this, but that's not what I meant. And so I hear it. I'm like, okay, I can see why that was perceived that way. Because remember, the, 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 the athlete is 13. 
And that's more of a statement that you made is more for a 17 year old. So if you ever want to have those conversations, I'm happy to have them. And with that, I am done. 